Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to episode 19 of The Killer Tea. On today's episode, we will be talking about the Black Widow, Mary Ann Cotton, Lady Lady Rotten. 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 We are your hosts, Chelsea and Christina. Hi. Hi. We made it to episode 19. 19, and it's not about Kate. Oh, Hell my yeah. God. I mean... I had, I did have fun with all three of us. Um, I will admit to you guys, it was very frustrating trying to figure out the mics. We had a lot of problems with sound. Yes, we did. But we are here now. Our mic quality is going to be superb. A1. <laughs> and in future episodes, if we're going to bring a guest on, we are going to have their very own microphone. Because yes. my obsessive compulsive ways cannot handle the inconsistent sounds they need to be crisp and clean so we like crispy sounds but we have this episode and one episode left before we are moving on to season two season two i can't believe we've made it this far our little chicken nugget is hatching and our little baby a birdie our little baby i can't be- i mean i guess that's backwards because it would come egg it would become egg then birdie then chicken nugget but you know it's evolving <laughs> <laughs> what started out as just a stupid hobby has turned into a bigger, uh, more invested stupid yes. hobby. Stupid hobby. <laughs> uh, we actually so- have people that listen to us that aren't our friends. So, I mean, hey. Well, I mean, right now, I am holding a book that one of our fans actually dropped off to us and that I used for research. So, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Today, we are talking about yet another lady killer. Um, yeah, another Black Widow. I mean, let's be real. I think most of Lady Killers are Black Widows. I know we touched on this before, but that's just what it be like sometimes. Mm. Us females, when we become serial killers, we kill those closest and most dearest to us. <laughs> yes, we really do. And people, the serial, the women serial killers who behave more like male serial killers are are extremely rare yeah they're the exception not the rule the lady that we're talking about today marianne cotton she really is like this stereotypical female serial killer on that note chelsea do you do you want to set the scene i can do that take us back to jolly old england again (laughs) once again we're back here (laughs) we're back so mary ann cotton was born on October 31st, 1832, how fucking fitting, in Low Moorsley, England. Happy Halloween. (laughs) Her parents were Michael and Margaret Robson, and she had a baby sister, Margaret, who died a few months after birth, and then a brother, Robert. Something that's interesting about her parents is they were both 17 years old when they gave birth to Mary and they were a poverty stricken family. They lived in a poor mining town. Her dad was a miner. He was a colliery sinker. Yeah. Uh, colliery I be- sinker. I believe that was an incredibly dangerous position. Well, I mean, mining in the 1800s was incredibly dangerous. Mining is in still incredibly dangerous. 2020 is still incredibly dangerous, let alone back then. You have to think of this time period in England. Children die left and right from starvation, from sickness, from cholera and dysentery. (laughs) Yeah. It is um, 
definitely a man's world. Women did not really have autonomy there. Well, once a woman was married, she basically signed away all her legal rights to owning any property, mm -hmm. to making any legal decisions for herself. Um, you know, even if she had been married, she wouldn't have even been able to sign her own will. She would have had her husband's permission. This is the era where the feminine ideal is that a woman finds completion and worthiness and all of that in being a mother and a housekeeper. Their only real aspiration was to find a husband. Find a husband and make some babies. So. Mary Ann's parents move quite a lot because her dad is looking for mining work. They move to where the work is. And that's not just normal for her family. That's normal for all of miners' families. Yeah, their contracts only last like a year. Yeah, when one mining contract ends, they move to another town. They start a new mining contract. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. I should point out that not just her parents, but most mining families were very religious. Mm -hmm. And... They use this as a way to kind of deal with the danger and all the death and injuries that came with being in the minor world. Mm -hmm. And so she was raised under very strict Methodist ideals, but was also considered to be a very normal and well-adjusted child. I also read that her father was abusive that she was more or less abused and she still had a loving relationship but i mean we're talking about the 1800s here yeah i mean <laughs> give or take but i i've read well, that he was very abusive and then also did have a tendency to drink alcohol raise your hand if you're if you're shocked by any of this information so like we mentioned Mining is very, very dangerous, and ultimately, when Marianne is 10, her father is involved in a very serious accident where he actually falls down a mine shaft. Yeah, not only does he fall down a mine shaft, but then the mine shaft collapses on him. Their family, their, their mother is the caregiver. She's the one rearing the children and, and maintaining the, the household, and miners actually lived in in homes specifically built and maintained by the mining company and they're only let out to mining families mm -hmm. so whenever this accident happens not only do they go through a financial loss and a gigantic emotional loss because they're losing their father oh and can we just point out that his body is delivered to their family in a bag that is literally stamped property of the South Hetton Coal Company. Mm -hmm. That's awful. I mean... His body is literally delivered in a coal bag. Trauma! Trauma. So they are kicked out. The, the oh, coal yeah. company kicks them out. Yeah. He's gone, so there's no reason for you know Margaret and Mary and Robert to be there. So they're like, sorry. Bye. Now the only thing that really can get them by is their mother has to find another husband. She doesn't have a way to make money. We'll see that Mary Ann will enter the workforce and bust her ass in order to find a means to an end, mm -hmm. but her mom has to do something fast in order to provide for her family. So within a year, she's remarried and they have a new stepfather that- George uh, Stott. Does not get along. <laughs> with Marianne and uh Mar no I'm sorry Marianne does not get along with him and the feeling is mutual yeah unfortunately yes and this actually leads Marianne to leave their home at the age of 16 and she begins working as a nursemaid a nursemaid is basically just a caregiver of the children that's her responsibility is to take care of Edward Potter's children but once all the children are school-aged and have gone off to school, she actually decides to go back home and learns to be a dressmaker. Not only is she doing that, but she's also working as a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. And the people in the community love her. Yes. Like, like they, they speak fondly of her. They talk about how pretty she is. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we don't have any red flags of any bizarre behavior. No. No I've, torturing of animals. No. And anyone, I mean, we're talking about the 1800s here, so obviously information is what it is. But she was considered to just be a normal person. Mm -hmm. um, this The book that I have 
Lady Killers by Tori Telfer has a excerpt that reads a former neighbor of her remembered her from her teenage years half a century later and still could describe her appearance at how pretty she was hmm. and even her fine dark eyes so she must have made an impression um i think she did make an impression because she clearly <laughs> didn't have any issues picking up husbands this is very true well speaking of husbands <laughs> she she becomes the dressmaker right yes okay so we'll get to the husband but she becomes the dressmaker and i i want to hit on this because it's very very important i think this changes her worldview forever when she becomes a dressmaker, she's now making dresses for, of finery and for the upper class and truly seeing what money can do for your life. She's now environments that are clean and sanitary and well-maintained and just the niceties that... A total 180 from, from her, world. her world and that what she grew up as a miner's daughter. And she wants that shit. Oh, yeah, she, she wants does. it bad. So tell us about her husband. This is when she meets William Mowbray. And William is a minor. William and Marianne are not married, but she becomes pregnant. The scandal. Scandal. And this basically forces her to marry William. She's not exactly thrilled about this because she doesn't want to be a minor's wife. No, she actually... That's the last fucking thing she wants. She She wants, she believes now at this point that she deserves finery Mm -hmm. and she wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. She didn't ever want to return to the mining village. No. She never wanted to be a miner's wife because that in itself is a grueling thing. Yes. So she, she, she's not happy. No, but she marries him because it's either marry him or basically be ostracized from her entire community. Mm -hmm. And at this point, she's only 19 or 20, and he's 35. Yeah. So he's a little bit older than her. They get married, and they move. Yes. Which, they don't move to another nice part of town. It's just... No, uh, they... I mean, they're back in a mining village. He's... William's a miner. She's constantly worrying about them falling back into poverty and ends up losing the baby... That forced her to marry William in a miscarriage. Yeah. She wakes up in the middle of the night to just blood everywhere. everywhere. At this point in time, I think she does place value in the baby. Yes. That she may or may not have loved it, but I think she does value the baby. And I do think this is traumatic for her. Well, and on top of it, there's not a lot of um, concrete evidence or concrete documentation on how often this happens but it is theorized that she actually ended up having multiple miscarriages Mm -hmm. over the next couple of years and that this actually kind of traumatizes her Mm -hmm. in that she doesn't know what she's doing wrong why she's losing these babies why she can't carry a healthy pregnancy at the end of her life she's even quoted as saying she has no idea how many miscarriages she ultimately had during that period of time yeah I mean, we're talking, just because it's the 1800s does not mean that postpartum psychosis and depression. Psychosis doesn't exist. If anything, it's been around. I can only imagine going through so much of that trauma at such, your brain is still forming. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's 20, 19 or 20, so she's still, by our terms, a child, and your brain is fully formed by 22. Theoretically, you're still developing your brain up until almost the age of 25. Mm -hmm. She is being traumatized by this, but in April of 1857, her first daughter, Margaret Jane, is born nice and healthy. William actually begins working on a steamboat Mm -hmm. instead of as a miner. He ends up being away quite a bit. Doesn't he take the steamboat position because he's tired of all the fighting? Um, I don't know if he's necessarily, I don't, I don't remember hearing much about that, but I know he does go and work on the steamboat. I think it's probably less 
slightly less dangerous mm-hmm. and probably brings in maybe a little bit more money. I had I had read that he took the position because they are fighting constantly About over money. money because now they have more mouths to feed. Mm-hmm. The mining money isn't bringing in enough, so he took the steamboat position because... Well, I mean, Marianne is terrified of living in poverty. Yes. She does not want to end up in that situation. But, you know, so he's off on the steamboat, but she still manages to get pregnant by him. And in December of 1858, Isabella Jane Mm -hmm. is born. So she has Margaret Jane and Isabella Jane. But in June of 1860, Margaret Jane dies under very mysterious circumstances while William is away. And there isn't any evidence on if Margaret is her first victim or Mm -hmm. if she actually fell ill. Because like you said, during this time, it wasn't uncommon for children to die from crazy illnesses. Yeah, so you're going to hear about a lot of children passing away in this podcast episode. And no red flags are raised because of the state of the world and the living conditions and, and just how typhoid fever oh yeah dip, um dysentery like those there's so many were things. rampant and children did not have a very long life expectancy no the other thing about the miscarriages that i forgot to comment on is at this point in time she blamed herself for them because that is what was perpetuated during the 1800s oh, was that it was the woman's fault yeah it was the woman's fo- fault the undue stress and doing too much around the house and worrying and sensitive feminine emotions caused the pregnancy to fail yeah so she blamed herself for all of them and looked at herself as a failure so i'm imagine i'm imagining copious amounts of things making this psychological cocktail mm-hmm. okay just wanted to touch back on that so her, her the oldest daughter margaret jane dies i'm sure she's upset about it if she did in fact not kill margaret but in december of 1861 another baby is born who she also names Margaret Jane. I tried to do a little bit of diving on this Mm -hmm. and having the first child named Margaret and then the second child named Margaret. It can be a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. It can be a state of denial. Mm -hmm. But for her, because we will, (laughs) there will be another thing later on. Um, I don't think it's either of those things. I think because of losing all the babies and a proclivity for death that maybe she is now desensitized to children and thinks that because she just can lose babies all willy-nilly maybe they're not worth as much i don't know i don't know but i think that's why she named the second baby margaret could be that's my well opinion the next year in november they have their first son john robert Mm mm-hmm and, you know, they're all excited. You have little baby John. But unfortunately, only a year later, after his very first birthday, John Robert dies from a gastric fever. You're going to hear this a lot. Again, speculation. <laughs> Did she kill her baby do you have the definition the definition of gastric fever because if not i'm going to look it up real quick no so gastric fever is a fever attended with prominent gastric symptoms name applied to certain forms of typhoid fever and it was kind of used basically to just describe any general yeah, yeah. tummy problems okay but typhoid fever and gastric fever have very similar symptoms as poisoning Mm. of arsenic. (laughs) Do tell. (laughs) So while these are unconfirmed kills, they are speculated. Widely speculated. I mean, let's be real. They're probably fucking. She probably started poisoning. And the speculation on why she started poisoning her children was... They were more mouths that she had Had to to feed. feed. Is this survival mode that she is in or is this narcissism? Oh, I think she's in survival mode. I think that she is so traumatized and tainted by her life up to this point. 
with money Mm -hmm. and that you know oh my god we're gonna starve and I think she's lost so many children that at this point she's kind of like I'm gonna kill them before something else does okay I think it's almost you still think she hasn't gone total baddie right now Mm -mm. I don't think she ever totally goes baddie I think for her everything is about control and about financial gain I think she's just losing her sense of value of life she does not like living in a man's world she just wants to be able to have control over her own body over her own life over everything that you and i that any woman would want right but in the world that she's growing up in she has to exist as a wife or she can spinsters don't do well so she had to get married and she had to have children and she resents the world for that Mm -hmm. It's interesting that at this time, this is when life insurance starts to become a thing. Yeah, because kids are dying left and right. Kids are dying left and right. Men are dying left and right from the jobs that they have to have because, you know, their jobs are still pretty dangerous at this point in the world. So William takes a life insurance policy out on himself and their children. In January of 1865, William actually ends up getting hurt on the steamboat that he works for and ends up coming home. (laughs) And this really, really infuriates Marianne because- She's like, motherfucker. If he can't stand up, bitch can't work. Can't make me money. Which means he's not making it any money, which means he's just an other mouth that she has to feed. And he's expendable. And she's not happy with him. And he mysteriously dies of a gastric fever. Hmm. hmm. So strange, so bizarre. Mysterious. So many so many poop issues in this family. I mean, this poor Marianne, what is going on with her family members? Why yeah. are they all getting so sick? It's real, real bizarre. Real, so real bizarre. She decides to move her children, which, hold on. Which children does she actually have left at this point? Who is alive? Margaret and Isabella. Okay, so we have Margaret the second, and Isabella are still alive. Mm -hmm. So she moves up to Seaham Harbor and actually ends up meeting a gentleman named Joseph Natras. N-A-T-T-R-A-S-S. Natras. Natras. Natras? Natras. Natras? (laughs) Natras. Natras. I don't know. Joseph Natras. But later discovers that he's married. (gasps) Scandalous. Scandal. And she's actually really in love with Joseph. Mm-hmm. Like, she wasn't all that in love with William, but she is head over heels in love with Joseph, and he is definitely the one that got away. They still have an affair. Oh, they have a very long affair. Yeah. And I think it's when she wants Joseph to actually marry her yeah. that she discovers that he's already married. Them's be knocking boots. Um, she finds out, says, fuck this shit, but keep my number (laughs) you know not number but you know keep my address for your calling card I don't know whatever whatever they did back in the 19th century who the fuck knows so anyway she fucks off (laughs) and she moves back to her former hometown which again she said I'm never gonna do this and she's there so she's really grumpy real grumpy she's not happy but she takes up nursing and she's beautiful she's charming all of her male patients love her Mm. and she flirts with them and while she's there she meets um a what she says is a well-proportioned and muscular man named george ward oh and george ward is an engineer. Oh, yes. Yeah. So she's seeing dollar signs and luxuries and all the things that she feels like she is entitled to but was deprived of. Mm-hmm. Ooh, homeboy's got it. So, But Marianne has a problem. Yeah, she got, for one, she got a baby. She's got two kids. Yeah. She sends Isabella to live with her mom, well, right? Well, in May of 1865, Margaret Jane II mysteriously dies of typhus fever. Mm-hmm. It's mysterious. Yep. yep. And she then sends Isabella to live with her mother. In August of 1865, 
she marries that strapping George Ward. Oh yeah, he he like he was madly in love with her after being um, her patient. He proposed almost immediately. But he is not a very well man. He is very sickly, requires a lot of attention, and is in pretty ill health throughout their whole marriage, which <clears throat> only lasts two months. <laughs> Oddly, it's not funny, but it kind of is. Oddly enough, so her kind of her modus operandi is turning into get knocked up, mm-hmm. ha- have premarital sex, yes, dance with the devil in the pale moonlight, <laughs> get knocked up, run to the altar, get married, get that insurance though, get that insurance money, kill the husband, kill a few kids. And then rinse like done the money. However, this time, so this is her second husband. Yes. But we're just kind of fast forwarding a little bit. So second husband, she actually doesn't get pregnant and no. she isn't pregnant at the altar, which ends up being very different for her. <laughs> she thought she might try something, something new. Something different. George had been ill. We all know this. She met him at the infirmary. But doctors are really surprised by his sudden death. He was on the mend, Christina. <laughs> Why did he die? Hmm. Super suspicious. He ended up not being a what he said he was, right? Well, he was an engineer, which he claimed that he made a lot of money. And he didn't. But he didn't no, actually so make a lot of money. She was super pissed about she that. She was pissed. And she was already, she, so she was really disappointed in that. And also, there's a lot of speculation that because she actually didn't fall pregnant while they were, they were together, and that is her modus operandi, is that he may have been disappointing in bed. Possibly. Because we know with her that she has no problems procreating. Yes. And is used to having two men at once. Hmm. So what, like one main boo and then one side boo. Well, anyways, she done. She done. She's like, all right, bye. And she gets a collection of insurance money yes. from his death. She gives him that killer tea, though. Mm. And he died. Yes. In not shortly long after that, about a year, November 1866, Mary gets hired as a housekeeper for a Mr. James Robinson and his children after his wife passes away. Marianne is like, sweet, I'm going to get this dude's money. Got to kill me some kids first. He'll come to me like, oh, my God, Mary Ann, you're so sweet and kind and loving and nurturing. And I'm so sad. That is exactly how her plan works out, too, because the very next month, John Robinson, who's James's son, dies of gastric fever while under Mary's care. And now this man had just lost his fucking wife. Mm-hmm. And now he loses one of his children. And Mary is all, I'm so sorry, I'm here for you. And she somehow magically becomes pregnant. Okay, wife is dead, kid dies. Kid dies. This is Christmas. So end of December, January, February, March, homegirls preggers. Like, I'm not saying that that's disgusting, but it's not nice is all I'm getting at. Yes. Mary's pregnant, and then Mary Ann gets a call that her mama is sick with hepatitis. So this is stressing her the fuck out because, A, she done dump, dumped Isabella at mom's house. How is she supposed to trap Mr. Robinson in marriage with all these, with, with the little Isabella drama? And also, she has this whole plan that does not involve taking care of another child. No, definitely not. So she goes to take care of her mother, rushes to her mother's side. I'm gonna help my mama get better. But her mom is on the mend from hepatitis. Like her mom is starting to get better. But nine days after Mary's arrival, dies after talking about having severe stomach pain. Suspicious. Very, very suspicious. Highly suspect. But this forces her to bring her daughter Isabella back with her. Mm -hmm. So, interessante. Someone finally was like, pourquoi? Because the neighbors knew that her mom was on the mend. And also, they thought it was bizarre that when she got there, 
she announced very loudly that it would be only a few days time before her mother would pass away even though her mother was getting better yeah they spoke out against how she was rummaging through all of her mother's possessions looking for things that were valuable valuable Mm -hmm. um and they thought it was very distasteful so at least it's very distasteful yeah Yeah. well i mean it's she's a distasteful bitch but at least someone started noticing her behavior yeah because at this point nobody else has called her out for shit and she's still well liked no the very next month in april of 1867 she brings isabella home with her everything's hunky-dory until elizabeth and James Robinson and Isabella all fall sick at the exact same time. And all three of these children die from gastric fever while under Mary's care. She tells her husband. I'm oh, they're thinking- not even married yet. Oh, yeah. She's tell- she tells the dude she's going to kill or planning to that, hey, don't come in here. I don't want you getting sick. I'm going to take care of these kids. Right. It all works out perfectly because she's able to annihilate these things that are in her way while also she feels like making herself look more innocent because her own daughter dies. dies. So it's almost like her daughter brought it into them. The other kids got sick and Mm -hmm. then, you know. So this actually ends up working out better for her. It does because in August, James marries her right the fuck up. Mm -hmm. And then only about a year later... Mary Isabella Robinson is born. Can we just talk about these fucking names? Mm -hmm. What is happening? I think she's a fucking narcissist. What is happening with these names? But in February, Mary Isabella dies from an illness. So she's born in November of 1867. I said 1868 before. I was wrong. (laughs) And then in February of 1868, Mary Isabella dies. Yeah, because she's not actually invested or interested in raising children. No, she's really not. She just wants to trap them. Trap them with the marriage. June of the following year, 1869, their second child, George, is born. And this is when James finally starts to become a little suspicious of his wife. Mm -hmm. Because she keeps insisting on insurance policies for James and the children that they have together. Not only that, but he's finding out that she's racking up these little debts yeah. and lying to him about it. Oh, and stealing money that she's supposed to be depositing into their bank account. Money that she's supposedly spent, she's actually holding on to for herself. Mm-hmm. And his oldest surviving child actually admits that he was convinced by Mary Ann to sell the family jewels. Yes. So... James is fucking furious. James gets pissed, kicks her out, and keeps their son, George. He's just like, no. Jorge, you're with me. Bye, bitch. So Mary's now homeless. She's just throwing a little hissy fit. She actually plays the victim in here and is like, she's, I mean, this is not an exact quote, but she's more or less says, I wanted to go out and have my hissy fit and come back, but when I came back, I didn't have a home. He left me. He abandoned me. The, it was boarded up. Boo-hoo. Bitch. Bitch, you killed his children. <laughs> Bitch, you killed his children, and you're robbing him blind. But, you know, you're a victim. You're the victim here. She ends up complaining to her friend, Margaret Cotton, about all of her troubles. And Margaret introduces Marianne to her brother, who is Frederick Cotton. And he is a recent widower and had also lost two of his four children. And so Margaret is like, yo, y'all have some stuff in common. You've <laughs> lost children. And, and Mar- Margaret's husbands. a spinster. She's healthy. Oh, yeah. Margaret is standing in as their pseudo mom to Frederick's mm-hmm. children, is helping Frederick care for his children. She's really just like a nice person. But then Margaret, um, she done dies. From a mysterious stomach ailment. Why did she take out Margaret? That's what I don't understand. Margaret is her friend. She's not a threat to her. It's all part of the ploy because she uses this as an opportunity to console Frederick. Mm. This is her in. Bitch took out her friend. Bitch doesn't give two fucks about anybody. I know, but like, 
Familicide, is that what it's called when you kill your family? Mm -hmm. It's very different than killing your friend. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's like I an think extra it, level. I think at this point, her value of life is completely diminished. Yeah, that's true. She's just like, whoever's in my way. So, X, 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 X. Out of curiosity, like, we now know, like, homegirls must have some serious apathy, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. We could say that. <laughs> Do you think that she always had this level of apathy oh, or do you no. think it I came? think I think this developed over time. I think that she was a normal person who got knocked up by a man that she didn't want to be with and then had multiple miscarriages that probably really fucked her brain up. Mm -hmm. And you I know I wonder if she had post traumatic stress disorder. I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. No doubt about it. And I think she began killing her children because she was freaking out about how she was going to feed these mm -hmm. children. Yeah. Because it seems like some things trigger her and she just, bah, yeah, snap. But I think after a while, like now we're at the point where poisoning people is just a means to an end. I, I kind of think she might like it. I think she might enjoy killing people to get them out of her way. I think so. Okay, where were we? So, she uses Margaret's death as an opportunity to console Frederick and gets pregnant with her 12th child. God We're on damn. baby number 12 now. God damn. In September of 1870, she marries Fred and they move to Walbottle, Walbottle, Northumberland, England. Oh, this is Mr. Frederick Cotton. Yeah, Fred Cotton. He's got no balls, Cotton. He's got no balls, Cotton. <laughs> and soon after that, their son Robert is born. Isn't she technically still married to what's-his-face? Technically, yeah. Mm. Okay, because that's the only crime Marianne ever actually admits to is bigamy. Yeah. Because she was technically married to two men at once. Yes. So she has her son Robert, but she soon finds out that Mr. Joseph Natras is only living a mere 30 miles away. Oh, shit. And he's no longer married. Oh, no. Oh, she snap. Go get your man. She rekindles this romance and then convinces her husband that they should move closer to him. I don't know how she convinces him of this, but she does. Um, I think they're they're in the same lines of business and there's jobs there. Possibly. So I think that's how she convinces him to go there. There's more job opportunities mm. for contract. Shortly after that, Fred mysteriously dies from a gastric fever. And she collects the insurance money. And then Joseph just happens to become what they call a lodger, mm -hmm. which essentially he was renting a room in her home. How convenient. Mm -hmm. How convenient. She needs employment because hubby's dead, right? So she becomes a nurse, right? And she becomes a nurse to an excise officer who is recovering from smallpox. Now, there is some dispute on what his name actually is. Some have said it's um, John Quick Manning, but then I've also heard that it was Richard Quick Man or go John Quick, Quick Man. We're just, he's I don't a quick know. man. He's a quick man. There's some discrepancy on what he's his name is. He's a real quick is. man. They have a really hard time finding it. Well, she actually ends up getting knocked up by him. Mm -hmm. While she's also having relations with Joseph. So, you know. As you do. As you do. Well, her stepson and her son, Robert. So her stepson, Fred Cotton, and her son, Robert Cotton, both die in March of 1872 from gastric fever. Mm-hmm. Which, fucking weird. And then Joseph dies the next month after revising his will to basically give everything to Mary in the event of his death. Now, they're not even married. Like, mm -hmm. Joseph and Mary aren't married, but he gives her everything in his will and then mysteriously fucking dies from a gastric illness. Yeah, and at this point in time, the, the townsfolk, they're talking. 
they're, they're talking a little bit. And right after this, Thomas Riley, who is a, per, who is a parish official, he asks Mary if she would become a nurse to a woman who is sick with smallpox. And Mary is like, well, I would love to, but can you commit my only remaining child, who is my stepson, Charles Cotton, who was Fred's son from his wife, will you commit him to a workhouse? Because I can't care for this poor woman and take care of my stepson. It's so the whole reason why her mother in the very beginning immediately got married was to do everything she could to stop her children from having to go to a workhouse. Yes. While Riley tells her that she would have to accompany Charles to the workhouse, Mary is like, no, 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 no. I am above this. Not doing that. Well, she fucks up and tells Riley that the boy was sickly. And this is a direct, well, a direct quote. She says, I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the cottons. Bish, what? This whole circumstance that she's in has gotten their neighbors talking, has gotten their community talking, and now she's had this interaction with the parish. Mm-hmm. And they're just, their sympathy is, is, it is not a bottomless well. It is drying up. And now they're starting to go, hmm, well, highly suspect. Then, a whole five days after making this comment to Riley, Charles dies. He dies. So Riley is like, yeah, this isn't okay. Goes to the (laughs) village police and convinces the doctor to delay writing a death certificate until they can kind of investigate on what's going on. Marianne, the heartless bitch that she is, doesn't even call the doctor after Charles' death. She just goes to the insurance office to collect on the money that she has on the insurance policy that she had convinced Fred to take out on her and him and all the children. It's there that she discovers that she's not gonna get any money until the death certificate is issued. But because they're investigating into Charles' death, they're not issuing the death certificate yet. Marianne's all flustered with this, and she claims that she used arrowroot to relieve his illness and said that Riley had made accusations against her because she had rejected his advances. You know, he's a well-respected parish parish official. Mm -hmm. And the local newspapers are like, I don't think so. They start digging in and find out that Marianne had moved all around Northern England and had lost three husbands, Mm -hmm. a lover, her friend, her mother, and 11 children and they all had died of similar gastric fevers. The doctor in their village who knew Charles and had been there to care for him took samples from his body and did tests to show that they contained arsenic. He told the police who then arrested Marianne. Well, then they decided to exhume Charles's body and she was charged with his murder But the trial had to be delayed because Mary's fucking pregnant Pregnant. with her 13th baby, who is finally born in January of 1873, and she names her Margaret Edith Quick Manning Cotton. So, like, who the fuck is this child's father? (laughs) Another Margaret. Another Margaret. Do you think it's, like, a joke to her at this point? Well, I mean, her mother's name was Margaret. I know, but it's so fucking weird. I know, it's fucking weird. It's so fucking weird. Well, they end up convicting her of murder, but the only murder that she's convicted of is for her stepson, Charles. Well, I had heard that they exhumed all the bodies and all of that stuff, but they couldn't find Frederick. They couldn't find his body. Did Hmm. you read that? No. Yeah. Um, In the book, Lady Killers by Tori Telfler, there's this interesting little part where they're talking about her being accused only of Charles Edwards' murder, but then they expand the charges to include Joseph, Frederick, and the baby, Rob- Robert. They exhume all of those bodies, but they couldn't find Frederick's, and they dug up several graves. Oh, my God. I did, not, I did not read that. Yeah. 
fucking weird. What is she? Okay, so what did she do with the body? Where did it go? Uh, I don't know. Where, where, he should be in the ground at the gravestone. He should be. So what the fuck happened? I, I don't know. I thought that part was really, really fucking weird. To make matters even worse, during her trial... Oh my god, I know a part you're going to talk about. During her trial, her lawyer... This is the most asinine argument I've ever heard. So he claims that Charles had gotten poisoned by inhaling the arsenic that was used as a dye in the green wallpaper of the cotton home. Okay. Did you read the part where they were talking about how she would breastfeed the baby in front of the court to get sympathy? Because that was like how the Victorian era ideal of a nurturing, loving woman was like the breastfeeding child and she did it to evoke sympathy from the court. But yeah, could you just... Could you imagine, oh, I'm on trial for murder, flopping a booby out, feeding my baby. Yeah. There was a poem written about her called The Angel in the House that was talking about when she was actually in court and on trial. Uh, and one of the lines says, for she's so simply, subtly sweet, my deepest rapture does her wrong. And nobody believed that this woman could have done these things so they're fucking writing poems about her in the newspaper Mm -hmm. like i wonder i seriously do wonder if it was because she was beautiful i mean it could be and it could just be because she was a woman in the 1800s and at that point they did not believe that women were actually capable of this well either way they found her guilty after 90 minutes of deliberation well good at least some people were fucking thinking clearly she was actually hanged in march of 1873 and the way that she was executed is is a little bit horrific. So she was hanged, but she didn't die from her neck breaking, but she died from strangulation because they made the rope too short. Hmm. And it's speculated that that might have been done deliberately. Like they deliberately made the rope too short so that it wouldn't drop and break her neck that it would drop her a little bit and she would be strangled. Out of her 13 children, only the baby Margaret and her son George survived her. And Margaret, I believe, only survived because she was literally under arrest at that time. And I believe George only survived because his father took him away. I think having all those miscarriages fucked her up bad yeah I I really do I think she had some PTSD and then there's also some speculation that she may have had it's not called this anymore this isn't the correct term but Munchausen by proxy is wait hold on isn't that um whenever you try to make your kids sick to get the attention right yeah I don't think that's it so I don't think that's it the speculation is is that not your kid, but anyone. Yes. Like you, you want somebody well, you, to be. You do it to someone that you're in. You're responsible for. Yeah, you're responsible it's for. It's usually a woman that like does it gi- to her the children. Gypsy Rose case. Yes, exactly yeah. like okay. the Gypsy Rose case. Now it's speculated that she may have had that. Whether or not, I don't really know. I'm not sold on that. But I mean, it it fits to an extent I because think she, she played would up the sympathy to skirt around her guilt I think yeah, it was a tool I, I agree with that too um, it's just one of the theories that I had heard on what could have been going on in her brain because Munchausen by proxy that's a terrifying thing yeah. that's terrifying I mean so we're coming up on season 2 and our whole thing is serial killers we don't do one off killers but we have talked a lot about maybe doing some bonus episodes and something like Gypsy, Gypsy Rose and her case could be a really cool one to cover it, especially it's a really interesting case yeah it is I mean, I hate to use words like cool, but I'm I'm sure if you're 19 episodes in, you understand what we mean when we say the things that we say. I would hope so. I would hope so. If you don't, please go back to episode one and start there. Anyways, <laughs> Christina. Anyways. The Dahmer scale. What are um, you rating Crazy Marianne? I'm going to go with a seven. She's a seven for you? She's a seven Jeffries for me because... 
for one bitch got a body count. Yeah, like a 21 lot. people. She got a lot in the ruthlessness. One thing you watch, one thing you learn by uh, watching forensic files since you were five years old is that death via arsenic is fucking awful. Oh, it is torture to die it that is way. one of the worst. Forget being decapitated and limbs being cut off. Death by arsenic is nonstop torture. And especially... Especially so, the way she did it. Yeah, she took several days well, and weeks and stuff to do doses, it. Well, in large doses, arsenic will kill you very quickly. Uh -huh. Like, if you're given a very large dose of arsenic, it will kill you, like, almost immediately. Mm -hmm. But the way she did it is she would do small doses over yeah. the course of several weeks. Your body is being melted from the inside. Like, I can't eat... She done disgusting fucked up. She's a 7 out of 10. I'm with you. I'm almost on an 8 just because my children are so little and I can't. I couldn't even imagine. I can't even fathom doing that to them. Someone like her, <sighs> I'm I'm totally fine that she was hanged. Me too. Bye, bitch. Bye. <laughs> I am totally here for the fact that she was hanged. Okay, we're going to do a palate cleanser. This is your palate cleanser. Oh, God. So there's this one that is What's-Her-Face from Legally Blonde. And it says, How everyone felt after watching Making a Murderer. I'm, like, totally a lawyer. <laughs> I can relate oh my to God. that. <laughs> I've got one. It says, Mix it up a little. Text a random phone number the following message. The fat one won't fit in the wood chipper. What do you want me to do? <laughs> So it's this adorable 1980s collage um, of a little, like, six-month-old baby smiling gleefully at the camera, and then you know how they did that floating head silhouette on the black background back in that era? Then it's this big, maniacal smile, and it says, I will murder your whole fucking family. <laughs> it's a little six-month-old baby. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, oh my god. Reasons I haven't committed murder today. One, I don't want to go to prison. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> oh god. I love you so much, I would provide you with an alibi in the event that your crazy ass snaps. <laughs> so killing a bitch is not murder. It's culpable homicide. But that's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fucking tea meme. Sarcasm, because murder charges are expensive. <laughs> oh, God. Never mistake my silence for weakness. No one plans a murder out loud. <laughs> the first line of almost any story can be improved by making sure the second line is, and then the murders began. <laughs> Oh, this is relevant. I feel a spree coming on. It's either a shopping one or a killing one. The choice is totally up to you. <laughs> relevant, since we're shopping Saturday. Oh, God, that's perfect. Oh, man. This is a, the picture of the back of a van, and it's got, like, the little stick figure family, you know? <laughs> Ooh, bless you. Sorry. And it says, innocent my family stickers, or... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it says... Innocent, my family stickers, or serial killer menu. <laughs> what if, what if those cute little family things were actually their body count? Oh. <laughs>if you like our podcast the best way to show us your support is writing a five-star review on any platform that you listen to us on no only itunes allows reviews oh well that's dumb well go to itunes and give us a five-star review and tell us how much you love us and that we're pretty and we're awesome mm. um but you can also give us a follow on our instagram facebook and twitter and twitter at the killer t and join us like one more episode i know one more episode of season one and don't worry we're only taking like a week break and then we'll be back with our yeah. shenanigans and we might even give you some bonus uh stuff yeah we got some uh mini sods mini sods coming up coming coming so at you there will be some changes um for season two 
We'll talk about them next we're, week. We're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit. But uh, all right, guys. Until next time. Bye. Bye. I don't know why I just waved. Like, <laughs> no one can see you, Christina. Join us next week for our season one finale where we discuss our hometown killer, Edward Edwards. The Sweetheart Murderer. Do you feel? I feel good. I feel good. My underwear's riding up my ass now. Oh, I'm super glad I got that on recording. <laughs> no. She wants control. I mean, any woman would want control, but she specifically does not fall in. Would you mute your goddamn computer? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs>